Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Teresa Saputo Crerand. I'm a 1987 graduate of Columbia College, the, the first full coeducational class, a 1992 graduate of the business school, and most importantly, a proud parent of my incoming firstborn daughter, Lucy Crerand, Columbia College class of 2022. <laughs> I am a co-chair of this incredible event. Last night, we kicked off Columbia's first university-wide women's conference, She Opened the Door, with an invigorating speed networking event for students and alumni and an enlightening keynote discussion with GSAS alumna, Abigail Disney. Over 400 alumni and students attended last night, and more than 1,000 alumni and students are participating throughout the weekend. Our schedule today is jam-packed with one amazing speaker and panelist after the other. I personally am really looking forward to our next keynote speaker, Faye Waddleton. It was at Columbia Business School in 1991 that I was first introduced to Planned Parenthood of Patterson, New Jersey for a project in a not-for-profit marketing class. I don't remember what grade I received, but I do remember interviewing and having the opportunity to meet and interview the young women who relied on Planned Parenthood services. Faye Waddleton was the national president at the time and an early hero for me. Before we start, some light housekeeping. The day's schedule after this morning's keynote, the first round of breakout sessions will be from 11.15 to 12.30. Then we will have lunch and another keynote speaker with Sally Krawcheck followed by a networking break and then a second round of breakout groups. And then we hope you'll all stay for the reception featuring alumni winemakers and student singers. Please keep your name badge with you at all times. It's your ticket. It grants you access to your sessions. The check-in station is in the north lobby if you have any questions. Please download the app if you have not done so for an um, even more fulfilling experience here. You can view session locations and speaker details, vote for the student poster you like best, and they are all along the wall over there. We have um, artists from across the 18 schools have participated. Uh, where am I? Oh, and you can also connect and message fellow alumni on that app. While there is still room in some sessions, we ask that you try to stick to the sessions you registered for. Staff at the door will let you know if there is room in a session should you want to make any changes. So moving on. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Bobby Berkowitz, the Dean and Mary O'Neill Mundiger Professor of Nursing at Columbia University School of Nursing and Senior Vice President of the Columbia University Medical Center since 2010. She is Professor Emeretta at the University of Washington School of Nursing where she served on the faculty for 14 years. Prior to her appointment as Dean at Columbia, she was the Alumni Endowed Professor of Nursing and Chair of the Department of Psychosocial and Community Health and Adjunct Professor in the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. Her primary research relates to public health systems, health disparities, and health equity. Please join me in welcoming Dean Bobby Berkowitz. Good morning. It's wonderful to look out at all these marvelous, talented, entrepreneurial, innovative women, and I think 0.5 men. <laughs> uh, it, is a, it is a real privilege to be with you this morning um, at this inaugural women's conference. Uh, she opened the door. What a wonderful tribute to all the alums uh, at Columbia's past, present, and future. Uh, and it's a, giving us an opportunity to celebrate women. It is a significant time to honor all those who have impacted our world in various ways, both professionally and personally. In that light, it is my great pleasure to introduce both one of Columbia Nursing's esteemed alumni, Faye Waddleton, one of my alumni, a nurse midwife, graduate, and journalist, Alexis Glick, who will be interviewing Faye this morning. So you're gonna have a real treat as these two dynamic women 
engage in a very exciting dialogue. So let me begin with Alexis. She is a graduate of Columbia College and a proud mother of four, is a financial media personality frequently appearing on CNN, where she provides her perspective on issues impacting global business, coll collaborative leadership, corporate leadership, and Wall Street. She has a contributor column in the Huffington Post and serves as a guest writer periodically on Fortune Insiders. She serves as CEO of Gen Youth, a nonprofit organization empowering students to create a healthier future for themselves and their peers. Faye Waddleton has had an impressive career. Most notably, she served as the youngest, first woman, first African American, and longest tenured professional to hold the position of president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America from 1978 through 1992. Faye is currently a managing director at Alvarez and Marseille, a global professional services firm where she is a practice leader for corporate governance. She has a track record for leadership for over 30 years, both as a CEO of a national not-for-profit organization and serving on the boards of public and private corporations, academic institutions, and high-impact philanthropic organizations. Just a few include Columbia Board of Trustees and other committees um, and organizations that have benefited from her service include um, Lincoln Center, my favorite, uh, the I Have a Dream Foundation, uh, and Estee Lauder Enterprises. She was the co-founder and president of the Center for the Advancement of Women, an independent, nonpartisan think tank conducting women-focused national research for public education and policy advocacy. Not surprisingly, Faye Waddleton has received many honors and awards. Among them are the 2004 Freeze Prize for service to improving public health and an induction into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993. Please join me in welcoming both Alexis and Faye. Thank you. Good morning. Everybody looks bright and happy. This is Faye Waddleton. Can you believe it? So before we, um, before we get to know the legend, the myth, and, and get a lot of wonderful pearls of wisdom from Faye, I, I want to remind you that part of our duty and part of my life and um, responsibility of, of what I do every single day is remind people that a discussion in a closed door setting is a beautiful thing, but it's a really beautiful thing to be able to share those pearls of wisdom with those who cannot be in the room. So I am here to remind you that you can share on social media. What a wonderful thing. Uh, the hashtag is, she opened the door. So I encourage you, when you hear some of not only Faye's experience and wisdom, but also some of her recommendations about where we are in our movement for women and Planned Parenthood, that you share out some of those messages so that we can reach those who are not here in the room with us today. So once again, Hashtag, she opened the door. You'll see I'm already tweeting. <laughs> Hence the phone. <laughs> okay, so Faye, uh, take me back for a moment. Uh, when I was reading the, your background and then talking to you in advance of this, I kind of marveled at this idea of how did, this, how did this kid from St. Louis wind up at Columbia University getting a master's, and, and what brought you to the Big Apple? Well, it's, it was a long journey, to say the least. Um, I am a child of Southern immigrant parents. Uh, my mother was from Mississippi. My father was from Alabama. Uh, they met up north, seeking a better life. They were the perhaps the the, the perfect example of people who were, who were strivers and upwardly mo upward mobility with upward mobility ambitions. Um, when I was six years old, my mother decided that her calling uh, to be a minister, as a minister since her teen years, needed to be full-time. And so as a child, we took to the highways and byways of, the, of this country, traveling around in, in revivals, tent revivals, 
um, that my mother preached at, and she stood very firm in her beliefs, fundamentalist Protestant woman minister. Uh, she f stood very proud and, and strong in her beliefs, and, and, and she preached against segregation. She preached against many things that were controversial at the time. Um, and I learned from her a, a great deal about standing up for what I believed in. I don't remember a time that I didn't want to be a nurse. I think that that was kind of put in my mind on Sunday night services, the, the, the um, missionaries that were back home from Africa on forward furlough would tell these glowing exotic stories. Uh, but also it was at a time when there were very few options that women were, that g little girls could consider. It was either to be a teacher, a social worker, or a nurse. And so I was going to be a nurse forever. That's all I can remember, that I would be a nurse. My mother had visions that I would become a missionary. It wasn't enough to be a nurse. You had to be a missionary. You had to proselytize. You had to convert people to the way of the Lord. Um, so we'll come back to that a little bit later, because I'm, I, I turned out to be a missionary, but it wasn't exactly what she had in mind. <laughs> um, and, and so I really had the nurse, the nurse ambition. Uh, my undergraduate nursing degree was from Ohio State. Um, and at the, at the end of my time, I felt that I, you know, there was something within me that I wanted to do more than just clinical nursing. I, wa I felt the need to, be, to have a broader look at how people live their lives. And this came, I, I'm sure, out of my deep religious, fundamentalist, Protestant religious upbringing, um, and that I wanted to do something that was broader, and so I came back to Columbia. Now, it's very interesting how I arrived at Columbia. You know, sometimes in our lives, people think, well, you've got to have a grand scheme, and you've got to have, a, you know, objectives and ambitions, and you go here first, and you go there first. I went to my obstetrical, um, obstetrics, I'm sorry, uh, professor, and I said, I want to go back and get my master's. Um, what do you recommend? And she said, well, wherever you go, make sure that it, there is a midwifery program component to it, uh, because that's the future of women's reproductive health. So I get my little, you know, catalog. It was paper catalog in those, year, those years. Um, and I find that there are three programs. Um, one of them is Catholic University, a uh, two-year master's program. I would, part of the clinical training would have been to go to New Mexico, to be assigned to New Mexico on Indian reservations to deliver babies in Indian reservations. The other was at Berea College and Frontier Nursing Service, which is a premier pioneer in the, in the field of women's reproductive health in the, collars of, in the hollers of Kentucky. Um, I didn't think I wanted to be on an Indian reservation for two years, and somehow delivering babies from horse on horseback just didn't fit my mood. <laughs> and so the other was Columbia, and um, and that's how I landed here. Um, and that was a seminal decision. It was it really changed the world for me because my clinical training was at Harlem Hospital. And it was the first time that I had really been taken out of the cocoon of my upbringing in a very real and profound way. And to see the lives of women and their suffering and the issues that they confronted in a large urban, low income uh, economic community. Uh, this would have been in the late 60s. It was a time of great economic and social turmoil in the country. So my, my, my uh, thinking was, was um, influenced by the, the sign of the times, and we'll get into that a little bit. But that's really kind of the journey, you know, uh, to, to tell you in, in just very broad strokes. So let's fast forward about 10 years, give or take. You get a phone call from Planned Parenthood. What is going through your head when you get that call? T take us back. Well, it was it was more, and and herein is the lesson to, you know, and we've talked about this in preparation for this conversation. Um, even though I now have begun to diverge from my upbringing, which was no drinking, no smoking, no dancing, no movies, praise the Lord to the to the church four or five times a week. 
if you're not a member of this denomination, you're going to hell. I mean, it was, we're really talking hardcore fundamentalism, and that's the way, that was the cocoon of my raising. I'm sure that, and I graduated from high school at 15, so I was still very formative. I'm positive that had I chosen another profession, I might have ended up in sort of that point of view in terms of how it informed my life. But I chose the, 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 the profession of nursing. And as such, I, and in those days, nursing professors were hardcore. I mean, really hardcore. We, I, we have not the time to tell you about the stories of, and the traumas of getting through uh, training and getting my degree in nursing at Ohio State. But the one principle on which I was building my career was that I could not make judgments about other people's lives that they did not need my judgment to care for them. They needed my understanding and my compassion. And that began to form my thinking about my obligation to do more than just what I was given in front of me. So after graduate school here, I was recruited to come back to um, my, public, my public health professor from Ohio State recruited me to come back to Ohio to be her assistant director. And so at 24, I became the president of the Visiting Nurses Association in Dayton, Ohio. And a year later was asked to join the board of the local Planned Parenthood. Um, I mean, I was, you know, still, I mean, as I look back on it, I was still a kid. Um, and a year and a half after, I was asked to become the executive director of that chapter. And seven years later, I became the national president. So the, the, the point that I'm trying to make in this, in this illustration is that I first had an obligation to do something more than what I was doing in my professional life, that I had an obligation because of everything that I had been given. And frankly, you know, I was raised by a preacher lady. There was a, an enormous amount of guilt that I had to be sure to, <laughs> to pay back the debt for, every, for, the, for the fortune I had. You know, my, my, I did not come from economic well-being, but I came from high-valued people that really had ambitions, social and, and personal ambitions that were deeply informed by a commitment to religious uh, values. I also grew up in, in St. Louis, you mentioned earlier, in a segregated community. Um, everybody, because St. Louis was segregated at that time, um, there were sections of the city that were illegal to sell to, to African Americans but in a way that sort of also informed my upbringing because I was raised among African Americans of all levels of the economic and social sta uh, status. And sometimes I think that's, that, was, that was very important for me because it really anchored my identity as an African American um, because you know I went to nursery school with our family doctor's son even though my, you know, my father was a construction worker, we were all together economically. And, and so it was not a community of just poor African Americans, but it was a community of quite mixed African Americans and a deep uh, commitment to the social structure of the church. And that really kind of informed the, the trajectory of my decisions. When you, when you date back to that decision to then take that job as the president of the national Planned Parenthood organization, this is right at the crux of the women's movement. It was a big well, deal. Well, it was coming upon a time when there was the ascendancy of the right wing and the religious right. Most of you in this room are probably too young to remember Jerry Falwell. I said most of you in this room. I didn't say all of you in this room. Okay. Um, but the emergence of the religious right was quite significant. And it wasn't as though I had no experience encountering the public opposition to Planned Parenthood. Um, although at the time, the chapter where I served as the executive director did not provide abortion services. We only provided uh, contraceptive sterilization but uh, services, but we did provide services to teenagers without their parents' consent. So the local Catholic priest railed against Planned Parenthood and me personally every Sunday uh, about 
the, the services that we were providing. So I had an inkling, even at the local level, of what, of the emergence of political opposition to women's right to have a choice. Because I became the executive director of the local chapter in 1970. That was at a time when the reproductive rights revolution was in full progression because Roe v. Wade was handed down in 73. That was also a time when anti-war sentiment, the civil rights movement was at, the, at its apex in terms of a lot of the achievements that would go on to be solidified and that we unfortunately take for granted. Um, and so it was, I wasn't uninformed. I also served on the national board for two years before I became president. So I wasn't quite as um, uh, un, uninformed. And I, I had a little bit of an inkling of what, was, what we were up for. I, I really, but let me tell you, when I became president of Planned Parenthood, I was the youngest, and these people were really crazy to, to have appointed me at 32 to head the national organization. I had just had a daughter. Um, I was married. Um, and, um, and, and of course, there were, there, there were those within the organization who also thought that the national board was pretty crazy to, um, to appoint me, but I had served on the national board, so I had some vi uh, profile in the organization. Um, and, um, and there was a sense that if I could go to the national organization, organize it, bring it to some degree of prominence. Now this was in, keep in mind, this is 1978. Again, many of you in this room were not even born. That if I could do that, and if I could give a speech or two from time to time at a local affiliate luncheon like this, it would be a good thing. Um, that that would be, that's what I needed. That's what the organization needed. I had no plan to become the kind of publicly visible leader that the forces of the time drew me in to be. But now keep in mind, I am now informed as a nurse coming from a very fundamentalist religious background. I have trained at one of the largest public institutions, hospitals in the country at a time when Roe v. Wade, when the protections of reproductive rights had not been recognized. Only recently was contraception legal. I had seen lives that I could never imagine. My, my master's thesis was in detecting drug abuse in pregnant women in prenatal care, during the prenatal period so that we could be prepared for their babies in terms of how to treat them. That was my master's thesis. This was about as far afield from tr tent revivals as anything that you can imagine. And so I, I, I saw what I saw, and I, and, I, and I think that this really informed my leadership and it informed and still informs my passion because I remember the days and what it was like for women and what it can never be again like that for women. And so I, I, I really felt that this would be kind of the core of my leadership. Now, it got me into a lot of trouble early on, even among Planned Parenthood people. There were people in the organization that thought that my first statement at the, at the um, um, press conference announcing my appointment was that we are going to restore Medicaid funding for poor women for reproductive health services. There was an enormous uproar in the organization over that. How, well, what happens if we lose our federal funds? What happens if, and my view was, if we have principles, then we have to stand for those principles regardless of the personal sacrifice. So, it was on the one hand, the, the challenge of a major national organization Far flung at that point, we had programs we were supporting in 68 developing country organiza organizations in 68 developing countries, still trying to save the lives of women around the world, which illegal abortion is still the number one killer of, in, of for maternal health deaths. And at that time, there were 211 chapters of Planned Parenthood, all of which I, I was convinced 
the executive directors and the, and the, not the people, because the people always seem to love me, but the executive directors got up every day and said, how can we make life miserable for Faye? Um, and, and because now I am a public person, 30 some people show up at the press conference announcing my, my appointment. And you know, this young, I was African American obviously, the first woman since Margaret Sanger. I mean, all of these things were really the markers for me to fail. And I was given some really good advice by a political strategist who said, you really have to up your game in terms of your public, the utilization of the public platform. Well now, I'm the daughter of, of a preacher lady who didn't wear makeup until, well, I did wear makeup, but I had to take it off before I came home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, so those were not things that I really thought about, but I had to go because I recognized that it, it really meant that I had to be prepared for the total package. I had to get my hair better, I had to have television makeup, you know, I had to get a little bit, you know, up the game on the clothes thing, so that the package would be not a distraction from the message. Um, it's not frivolous, it's not, it's not something we should be ashamed of as women. Um, we should not try to dumb down how we look or what we say, but to recognize in the fullness of what we present. Um, that the visual is also important. So I got myself a speech coach, and I got myself a makeup person, and I got myself a hair person, and there I was on television with Henry Hyde telling him that we are gonna fight you and make sure that poor women don't suffer because of your efforts, and then during the television breaks, telling him if he doesn't stop making passes at me, I'm gonna have him taken off the set during the breaks. Bravo. I, I want to ask you one last question about the past before we move to the, to, the, to the current environment, because I think most people in this room want to know if you were leading Planned Parenthood today, what you would say. But I think if you could just, for a moment, talk about, I presume over that tenure, which was a long tenure running Planned Parenthood, there were moments where you felt very alone. How did you persevere? Well, yes, there were many moments, many hours. I felt very long, alone um, during that time. Um, four years into my presidency, I went through a very difficult divorce. Um, I now was a single mother of a six-year-old, um, and so restructuring and reordering my life, my personal life, with the recognition now that I, as the leader of Planned Parenthood, was kind of the embodiment of the organization. And I don't say that with conceit, I say it with a recognition that people like to see, well, who's leading this thing? I mean, you know, I mean, yes, I mean, who's, who's the voice? Who can we turn to, who can we attack um, in, in the name of attacking Planned Parenthood? And um, so it was, it was keeping that out of the, the recognition that I had a responsibility to keep my personal tribulations out of public view, which was not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Um, but also to um, sort of recognize that the nature of large federated organizations is that it's always going to be highly political. The people who come to those organizations are very passionate about what we believe in. There will be dissension and, and uh, disagreements and there will be efforts always to take the leader down. Um, it was a time of great turmoil in the country as well um, and it was a time when the opposition to everything that Planned Parenthood stood for and all that at least during my career I was I was driven to work for because of my professional background was under attack as never before. And I had been told, I mean, I, I had been advised by David Garth again, that one of the problems, and I think it's instructive to, to this very day that informs where we are today, one of the problems of achieving a revolution is that the revolutionaries go home. They think, we have won. Now, birth control was made legal in, 19, in only 1965. 
let me tell you, that's, that is nothing historically. It was not legal to practice birth control in the privacy of a married couple's bedroom until 1965. Roe v. And there were a whole series of, law, of laws, and I'm not going to take the time to go through them if anybody's interested in, in them. You know, we certainly can discuss it afterward. And that led all the way to Roe v. Wade in 73. And so the, 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 the wins were very clear. Don't forget, Father Greasy was railing against me in the late 60s and the early 70s, and um, and the emergence of the opposition to the, the now the recognition of the right of a woman to control this most important aspect of her body was enshrined in, by the Supreme Court, triggered the revolution, the opposition to the revolution. Let me just, and I know that this is a group of rather of diverse women, and. And so as we move into this next stage of, of this conversation, let me just say that I have been called everything from the princes of death to um, desire to, to engage in racial genocide, um, to, you know, to put my people out of business. Um, to every, I have been picketed, I have had, um, I have been spat at, I have, um, and I don't say that because I need to be on a crucifix in any way, it's just an observation of how deeply held people's views are, and when they are extreme, they become very dangerous. I have always tried to inform my public advocacy with a recognition that this is not about whether you will be forced to have an abortion. It is about whether you will have the liberty to ha make that choice for yourself. And, and so I've been asked a number of times, well, I'm sure your mother was really upset with you. Yeah, she was. Um, she used to go to church and ask people to pray for me to come out of this work. Um, when I announced that I was retiring after what turned out to be the, so far the longest tenured presidency of Planned Parenthood, and 22 years in the organization, she was she was happy during her sermons to tell people that her prayers had finally been answered. <laughs> um, but there was no schism between my mother and, and me because if I really believed that this was really about protecting the personal choice, without persecution or prosecution then I had to honor my mother's views about this. She wasn't so honorable about my work about this, but I still had to come, I had to be non-hypocritical and honor her right to hold those views without being attacked and without, without attempting to persuade her to another point of view. Um, she had always taught in her sermons that you should keep what is God's God's and what is Caesar, Caesar, so that made a lot of sense to me. The government should stay out of your personal business, right? Um, but, she, you know, not, not in her translation, at least on this matter. So it was, you know, it was a time of, of, of personal transition for me. Um, and what I've tried to say in this conversation is that leaders, yes, are often quite alone. And if you do not have the companionship of your principles, if you do not have the companionship of believing, and I suppose one could interpret this to be the companionship of extreme and radical uh, points of view too, and those people are loners as well, but if you don't have the companionship and the belief that what you are working for is right and just, then the loneliness really has no way to be rewarded. Um, and, and as you, as I gained more national prominence and as the beauty magazines started covering me, and, and my view about that was, you know, I, listen, I'll do any interview, even, you know, the humanist, I became the humanist of the year, which made my mother very upset. Um, um, you can laugh about that, it was, it was, she was very upset. <laughs> Um, but I felt that there was a lot of support for what I tried to do 
among journalists who could not openly take a biased position, but they could cover my voice. And if I could not, and, and, that, and, and my growing into my leadership and maturing into my leadership was to recogni recognize the amplification that that permitted. Now we're seeing amplification in the White House without a seemingly a recognition for the enormity and the irresponsibility of how it's being used. But I think that for any leader, go, there goes with it also a satisfaction that you can amplify issues that others don't have the ability to do so. Now that can be a dangerous um, um, aphrodisiac. I mean, you can kind of get off on that. Or you can recognize that that's an enormous responsibility. You are uh, sitting in the White House right now, and in my seat is the President of the United States who has had great opposition to the work of Planned Parenthood. Well, lately. Lately. <laughs> but we know, flipping lately. and flopping. Lately. You were sitting down with the president, what would you say? Well, I would try to, you know, first of all, I'd probably not ask him, you know, what was going on, what's going on in his head. He obviously is, <laughs> is sees this for its political opportunism. Um, I would say the same thing that we said to a lot of members of Congress and that we said to Ronald Reagan when we took him to court over and over again to block the effort to defund Planned Parenthood, to block the effort to make it a requirement of federally funded programs, to report to parents when they served minors. We, you know, we, it was a field day of lawsuits that we brought. During that time, I became a, a prouder American, however, because I realized I could bring a lawsuit against the President of the United States and live to tell the day. I mean, you know, um, um, but I would, I, I might not try to persuade him to a different point of view that he seems politically expedient, but to try to help him to understand, and, and this is only one example, that using women's lives for political gain is really a very dangerous strategy. I would also be happy to tell him that we have fought you to a standstill. Um, I spoke to Cecile Richards uh, earlier this week, and there is no anti-family, Planned Parenthood defunding, or no defund Planned Parenthood in the continuing resolution. They now are sufficiently intimidated they are sufficiently frightened of women. Out of the, the Alabama. <laughs> out of the Alabama vote that largely was, was brought about as a result of women opposed opposition to this Mr. Moore guy. Um, and, and also black women especially coming out in droves that resulted in his defeat. There's <laughs> There is an idea that we, we really ought to leave these women alone. And so there is the, the defunding is, I think, an example of what can happen when citizen engagement is real, is passionate, is sustained to push back the forces of repression. Because this is still a country that, by and large, is, is a moderate country that believes that people should, have their, their, should be able to carry out their lives as they see fit. So you sit here today and you look at this Me Too movement where women are speaking up. Now, time's up. You know, one, Faye, what's your perspective on it? And, and secondly, is it, uh, is it helping the cause of what you have stood for or is it creating mixed messages? Well, social change is always messy, so let's just can we agree on that? It doesn't happen on a neat little trajectory with a bow tie and we got this change and it's, it's done. What I see in the current upheaval and eruptions is the need for, for putting all of this in context. Um, we can take a lot of responsibility for a great deal of complacency and tolerance for the mistreatment of women in our society. We can take responsibility for that. For half of, 
take responsibility. Half of the population is comprised of women, and yet we, we seem to be excited that suddenly somebody is speaking up on this. Um, I think we have to also put it in the context of the arc of history that when there is social, when there is change, that there becomes an inflection point, when there is, is, is major difficulty and, 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 and conditions that are unacceptable, that are intolerable, that's the word I'm looking for. And there is a degree of tolerance for the intolerable. And there is an inflection point that something happens that mobilizes the collective consciousness and emotions. In the civil rights movement, it was perhaps Emmett Till who was, was lynched and, and massacred in Mississippi. And, and his mother left open the casket to show how badly beaten and, and mangled he had been in, in, the, in the murder. Um, that really did call the consciousness of the country to the injustices of black people in this country and the brutality of segregation and racism in this country. I can go on to, to, to describe other examples. Selma certainly made it possible for the Voting Rights Act, um, the, the beatings at that, uh, at that bridge. On reproductive rights, the thalidomide um, uh, epidemic where babies were being born as a result of mothers or women, um, and I don't use mothers when I'm speaking of pregnant women. They are pregnant women. They become mothers when their children are born. But thalidomide and the rubella um, uh, epidemic where there were children born with very severe birth anomalies and very severe uh, life-threatening conditions elevated the consciousness of the country. The, 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 the peace movement, the war movement, the photos that came back from, from Vietnam, I could go on and on. When I was working with the Center for the Advancement of Women, we conducted a national survey, actually we did two, polling over 3,000 women, asking them what did they think that the next wave of the women's movement. Now this was in early 2000s. We're talking about almost two decades ago. What did they think that the number one issue that an org a regenerated women's movement, pursuing perhaps even the Equal Rights Amendment, what did they think the number one issue should be? And overwhelmingly, it wasn't even close, addressing violence against women had to be the number one issue. Now this was in 2000. It took a period of time in which there had been, there was continuing to be this continuing tolerance of how women are treated. Perhaps it's in parallel to the progression and the success of women in the business world. The fear that is generated when the social order is, is, is changing that we can see in racial and ethnic di dis, uh, uh, diversity and the, the change that is taking place that creates this kind of rebound fear needed to find a place that it could emerge and touch the, the national consciousness of this nation. I think that what has happened is that the door has been opened. This is not new to women's lives. This is the point I'm making. What we found in our research, they didn't even care about, you know, Addressing sexual and, 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 and domestic violence wasn't even close to equal pay for equal work or protecting reproductive rights. It was the number one issue. And we polled this over and over again. Well, I don't mean to say we polled it a half dozen, but we did poll it three times. And so I think that, that where we are right now is a point that is very, very serious, that the collective consciousness of the nation has been called to attention on the conditions of women's lives in this regard that have been hidden, that have been brutal, and that have damaged women. We've allowed it to happen. Now the only question is what do we do going forward? Yes, there will be excesses. We have to be quite care about due process, by the way. There will be excesses. There always is when there is a revolution. 
But this is really a point in time. This is, is the tipping point that I think that it provides us with an opportunity to really move forward once the eruption has subsided, and it will. The question will be, will it subside and we go back to complacency and figuring, well, they spoke up and me too, and that's what I've done. Or will we say, now we've got to organize to make sure that, to really move toward public policies. I think that this may be an opportunity to reform around an equal protection amendment to the Constitution. So it's an inflection that we have to decide what we do with. It's great to, to, to have a lot of voices, make a lot of noise, beat a lot of drums. The same thing happened with reproductive rights, the same thing happened with the peace movement, the same thing happened in the voting rights with the voting rights with the civil rights movement, and you see the forces that have taken back those movements. Roe v. Wade no longer exists as it was handed down in, in 1973. States no longer have to protect the, 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 well, uh, the health of women in, in restricting the access. Um, there is an every effort to roll back the reproductive health services, only due to the efforts, the political organizing and, 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 and advocacy and determination and activism of women and men who also support this point of view. But we can't lay this off on the men too we, this is a woman's issue, and we need to own it, take responsibility, organize for it, and say that in this country, we will not have a world in which women are brutalized in any form. So we sit here in 2018, and I know in our conversation leading up to this, uh, we, talk, we talked a little bit about how this current movement of women coming out, um, many women feel rightly so empowered and they want to make a difference. The question is now how to make a difference. What counsel, what advice do you give to us in the room to make sure this isn't a movement based on a social media campaign or the ability to come out and share a story, but it's a movement that translates for our, our daughters, and frankly, for our sons to understand how women should be treated. Well, it is, I mean, I, I, I think that you, you frame it excellently. Um, it is about values, and, and that requires the public pulpit and the continuing voices. I don't mean in any way to suggest that the voices should be muted. I rec I, I'm suggesting that the voices must be followed by real effort to restructure the, our systems that women no longer find it, find these as a part of their acceptable experiences. Um, and so I think that, you know, when we were talking about this and coming up to this, I, I told you about a, an experience that I had early in my presidency of Planned Parenthood um, where I was actually, it, it probably saved my life because I was scheduled to be on the, the uh, podium with Anwar Sadat in Egypt um, as, a, um, uh, as a guest of the Egyptian government and as a guest of our project director who at that time was a priest in the Coptic church, in the Catholic Coptic church in Egypt, who was assassinated on the podium with Anwar. So I would have probably been at least privy to that situation if, I mean, uh, privy on the, I would have been a witness to it rather, if not been um, a victim of it. However, I was saved by Jeremiah Denton and Orrin Hatch. <laughs> and I was called to testify on behalf of Planned Parenthood um, to their Senate committee that was investigating the, the abuses of Planned Parenthood and the abuses of our federal funding. Um, and um, before the hearing, and it, it turned out that it was like, I think I was at the witness table like something like four, maybe even five hours. But before the, 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 um, the uh, interrogation started, um, Mr. I think it was Mr. Denton, he was a senator at that time, he was a, um, a Vietnam War hero and he was a senator from Alabama, 
No, it was Orrin Hatch. Um, uh, asked the, the, the Senate leaders, uh, um, marshals, to remove anyone in the gallery that was, was not of majority age, any minor in the gallery, because they were about to discuss Planned Parenthood's literature that they considered pornographic. And they had a, they had a huge display, and among the pornography was, a, you know, were, was literature about masturbation. So, um, but not only were we taken to task, I mean, they, they had a whole litany of things that they, that, uh, grievances that, that they wanted me to answer for. But among the grievances was our illegal lobbying activities, that we were engaged in this tremendous effort um, lobbying, and we were a nonprofit organization, and it was against the law for nonprofit organizations to engage in such activities, uh, to the extent that we clearly were because Oren claimed that he had gotten 200 phone calls at his office the day before. Now, you know, again, I'm young in, my, in my, my national leadership, and so I'm still learning, and that's one of the things that, you know, I think sometimes happen, that, that people believe that leaders come full form, you know, you're a great leader, that somehow somebody's anointed you, and you, you know, you're all together, but that's not true. Um, that every day you have a day to make a fool of yourself. Um, and, and hopefully you, you learn along the way. And I thought to myself, wow, I used to think that you used to, you'd have to mobilize, you know, the kind of mobilization that we saw during the Vietnam peace movement and the kind of mobilization around the ERA. And this dude is worried about 200 people calling his office yesterday. And so what was instructive about that is, is that it doesn't take armies of people to have an impact. It takes dedicated, determined folks that organize themselves in a way with a, with a single message that is repeated over and over and over again and not compromised and not searching for this so-called common ground. I have no idea what that means. What do you mean by common ground? We are on common ground. You get to do what you want with your life, and I get to do with what I want with my life without you meddling in my life. Now, if that's not common ground, I don't know what that means. So I, I guess I'm really talking quite frankly this morning, more frankly than I usually do. Um, maybe it's my old we age like or that. something. Um, but um, I, you know, I just think that we, we sometimes minimize the power of an organized effort. And I guess Margaret Mead used to say that, you know, never underestimate what an effort of one or two determined citizens, because it's really the, and I'm paraphrasing it, it's really the only, th the only way that things have ever changed. And, and so I hope out of the voices and the, the, that this really does become an inflection of organized efforts. Yes, you're, most, many of you here are students. There are student organizations that can become vehicles. There, are, there is a lot of structure already to which one can attach their involvement, um, their resources, their money. Don't underestimate what a dollar, let me tell you, the lifeblood of our activism when I was president, the organization is much better off today, were the people who would send me $25 a month, that they would become sustainers, and they would say, I make a commitment to send Planned Parenthood $25. Well, those were 25 unrestricted dollars that the foundations weren't telling us what to do, that we could use it to go make noise and to go make trouble for people who wanted to really roll back the, cl the clock for women. Brilliant. Okay, let's open it up to questions, because I'm sure there are, I'm sure, some of you in this audience would love to ask Faye a question. We have mic runners around the room um, on the left and the right. So all you do is raise your hand uh, right here in the middle is a question, and then we'll come to you. He, uh, let me just say, time is precious. So just say, uh, you know, your name and, you know, uh, when or if, you know, when you graduated uh, or if you're a student, that's fine. And then just to the question, let's, you know, keep our, our timing quick if you don't mind. Um, my name is Vivian Coyne, and I was Columbia College class of 2013 and SEPA 2014. Um, and you talked about both your mother and your community growing up, 
and I was hoping you could talk about the importance of role models in your personal and professional life. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. The importance of role models, clearly my mother had tremendous influence on, on my life and on the values that have guided my life. Um, in, a, in a kind of a, I don't want to suggest it pejoratively, perverse way, the, the, the principles in which I was raised, which was to stand up for what you believe in, kind of turn, turn themselves on to her, it wasn't exactly what she had hoped for in terms of the outcome. Um, but it stayed with me. And so, first and foremost, the people around me, I was surrounded by very strong women in my family. My mother had uh, three other sisters, and they were all seamstresses, and they all loved to look good, and they all um, believed that there was a certain way that you had to behave, and your hair, your hair had to be a certain way. You had to speak in a certain way, or white people would look down on you. And so there were those early formative years that were role models. And these were the years in which blacks were really striving to achieve true equality. So I came of age in the 60s and, and the 70s. I, you know, I've not been a big believer of putting a laser beam on one person and say, I want to be like that person. Um, I believe that we have to be open to many, to the ways of many and to take from life its experiences and how it instructs us, which is why I hope that this Me Too movement in, is instructive and doesn't just become a release, that we turn and look at what do we learn from this, and that we learn, you know, we have roles, I mean, my daughter has a tremendous influence on me. When she tells me that something doesn't look good or I didn't say something, you know, that speech wasn't so great, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I struggle. I'm really upset about that. Um, and so she had, oh, by that I'm saying that, and by the same token, when she, you know, celebrates and salutes me, I feel like I'm on top of the world. All I'm saying is that we take from life in its portions as we can all of the time and be open and, and, and I, you know, I believe that one of the reasons that I was effective as a leadership is because of the way I was brought up. And so the opposition to what I was doing really, you know, I understood where they were coming from. Um, I didn't turn that off. I, I, I understood what was the basis and what, what really drove their commitment and, their, and, and where they came, come from. So I, you know, I think as all of us, as we may be mothers someday or that we have influence on young people, as my mother used to say, pretty is as pretty does. And that, what that meant is, what role are you presenting to other people who may be observing you? Question right here in the middle. Wendy Heckelman, uh, Teachers College 1992. So you were just stating that uh, change is pretty messy, right? And what concerns, or a concern that I have, and I'd love your perspective on, is with the emergence of the Me Too, my concern is we're gonna find men that will start to um, pull back on mentorship and sponsorship, and I think it's pretty critical that we engage, you know, that we, what recommendations do you have to sort of counterbalance that, because I think it's gonna be pretty important as we move forward. Well, as, I, as you've said, um, I, I do, you know, change is not, is not neat and, and nice and, and um, uh, tidy. Um, I, you know, I, I have never met a feminist who burned her bra, and yet that is still the label that is placed on women who fought for the progression of women's rights even today. 40, 50 years later. There will be people who will perhaps use it as an excuse to pull back and withdraw. But I think that as the dialogue emerges, it will become a little bit, it'll be less emotional and more now what do we do about this. There, I mean, I don't think that we're there yet. I think that there's going to be a lot more. But without this kind of eruption, we probably never would have had any kind of change. Because this woman, you know, where was, her, where was she when she had a black eye that she, you know, somehow hid it from the world 
and now we're learning about it this week. And so, so much has been glossed over and we pretend like the, you know, everything is okay and we want their cooperation and we want, you know, to have a collegial engagement, but yeah, yes, we do want those things, but we want them without violence. And so there will, I believe, I'm, I'm really quite optimistic that there will evolve a dialogue. If you look at the, at, at the, the, the concerns that have been, um, that there's been a hot debate over in the college, on college campuses around sexual violence on college campuses, a lot of the early public dialogue about that was extreme and per, perhaps excessive. And now it's like, okay, how do we structure and let us worry about the Department of Education not rolling back um, some of the gains that have been made, although the necessity to be sure that there is equal protection for everyone. But how do we structure public policy, public attitudes, public sanctions against bad behavior that is fair and just for everyone, including women? Is there a question? Oh, sorry. Oh, right here. Right here up front is a question. <clears throat> oh. Well, oh, while sorry. they're coming, why don't we... Yeah, but yeah, start here and then we'll come over yeah. to you. Sorry, you don't have a microphone, you poor thing. Okay, we'll do that um, in a second. Okay, I'm absolutely fascinated by this whole idea of coming together because um, I'm aware of the history of St. Louis. My father was from St. Louis and the community, they had their own hospital, they had their own doctors. Homer G. Phillips. Yes. yes. And how you were raised to be a strong woman and to speak up and you know, the, the whole idea of communities communicating now so that the strength of a particular community that was developed maybe in, under a um, segregated situation can be shared with another community where women were trained not to speak up. Um, and this whole idea of sharing experiences is so important right now. It is important. Um, um, and the reproductive rights movement has used this quite liberally and broadly in terms of, of sharing the experience and experiences of the stigma of abortion and those of us who had those experiences. Um, there is still a great deal of, you know, even on the areas in which there are, are, are social sanctions, there is still an effort to try to still hide there's a lot of shame that is affiliated. I mean, we've heard out of these Me Too voices, a lot of the reasons that I didn't share is because I thought I brought it on myself. I was ashamed. And so relieving the blanket, opening the veil of shame is really one of the positive aspects of these public voices um, that I think, you know, let's take from this, that's, that, let's recognize that in social change, this, what we're going through is probably inevitable with something that has been really, really terrible for women's lives. And then from it, let's begin to move forward and not say, oh, we gotta pull back because we'll make men unhappy or they'll, go, they'll turn away from it. Well, they probably will, but let us keep moving forward for those who are willing to go with us. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the, you know, there are, are stereotypes about black women. You know, we're always, you know, stereotype is that we talk too much, we're in your face too much. You know, if you look at the, at the ads on television, the one who is always sassy is the black woman. I don't know why that's the case. But in any case, we were taught to be quite verbal and communicative, that we, we communicate in a very direct way and perhaps that emerges um, from our ethnic background. Um, that has certainly informed my life. I mean, I, I was not a, to, the, to the, you who asked who was my, my role model, I was never afraid to speak up, you know, and, to my mother's dismay, even when I was two years old. Um, um, so I, I think that sharing is important, but also sharing, the reason that I look at, the, at the, the way that I was brought up in a segregated community as having been a positive for me. Now I know that that's, that's almost her heretical for people to say, because I'm not promoting segregation, but I am promoting a certain degree of identity, an identity with a common condition. And that, I think, is the first step 
for sharing and for anchoring us in an identity with a common condition. So I hope out of this that we will recognize that this is so prominent and pre prevalent, prevalent and prominent that this is a common condition for all women and so we have to keep talking about it, but talk is not good enough, that we really have to, have to translate that into concrete change. Yes. <coughs> Uh, hi, I'm Maria. Uh, I am a uh, master's public health graduate in 92. Took me nine years because I've been a single mom raising my son and started a business when he was three. So I want to say, and I'm currently studying uh, trauma, and the fundamental um, block of women and, and men as well is the trauma that uh, they're exposed to from childhood and through the course of our um, social integration in schools, etc. I will tell you, I am one of the Me Too people. And I, coming up in, I'm 62, so coming up in that time frame where the options for women were, as you described, that I experienced myself, but also if you are uh, seemingly attractive to the male population that you're working with, there seems to be this um, boys will be boys mentality that uh, makes you believe it's a man's world. And that was the framework that I was coming up in. This is a man's world. And I'm very glad for the Me Too movement because like anything, and as you said, um, Faye, it's uh, in the beginning, it creates a big stir. Um, the people that are getting the attention are the celebrities, but there are a myriad of regular people that don't have a voice and feel that's what they have to do to get ahead or that their, their social, their, their work and is compromised. So I think it's a wake up call to men to learn how to see women as another person, a human being, and not as an object because we have been objectified for far too long. Uh, the content of what's on television, the Do movies. you have a question about well, that? Well, my question is how to um, how would you suggest what the conversation consists of and what the next step is? Well, I think the conversation is not a singular conversation. I think that, that it is one that has to take place in communities as well as on the national stage. Um, I think the conversation has to, has to be, and this is the hard part, enduring, that it's not one conversation and that it's, it's really, we still are at the, I believe, at the inflection point where there is a consciousness raising that is necessary to precede change. It's not going to be neat and tidy. It's going to be a long haul. Keep in mind, I, I said the research was showing two decades ago that women felt this was the number one issue in their lives that needed to be addressed. So I, this is a long marathon journey because it is so deeply embedded. I have really been quite surprised at at the level of which these, these voices emerging. Um, I think it, it really is important for us to take responsibility, for every woman to take responsibility, that women are not going to be punished and are not going to pay a price for, for coming forward and telling their story. Now, so that means individual engagement as well as supporting organizations that are addressing the conditions of women on an institutional and on a systematic basis. This is not something that is going to be rooted out and taken care of very quickly uh, because it's too embedded in our culture, in our values, about the values of women. The attacks on reproductive rights have been a proxy for the position of women in society and our role in society and our power in society. We have seen it as perhaps just that this is an attack on reproductive rights, but really it has really been a, still a fundamental attack on women not having that 
power to move into another role in society other than that of childbearing. The forces that have violated women in many ways are the same forces that want to bring back women to traditional roles where we stay in our place, where people other than women are in power. We are told what to do, that even when we achieve the business accomplishments about which we should all be very, very proud and the wealth about which we, have all, we should be very, very proud of having accumulated, there is still, but you're a woman. And we, you know, we have to look in the mirror. We've taken a lot of responsibility. We have to take a lot of responsibility for changing that. It's not up to men to change it. They're, you know, people don't give up power. It really, you know, let us not believe that we've got to work with men for them to give us power. We have to be really the take responsibility and be responsible for, for working at this until things really begin to change. And I know that we have business women who have achieved a great deal in the for-profit economic world, and I'm sure that their stories are, you know, heartbreaking, and the price and the sacrifices that they have had to make to achieve CFO of a major national corporation, the last bastion of male power. Um, the book that has just recently uh, been published about what goes on in Silicon Valley, these, these young men that were supposed to save us from, the, from whatever it is they're saving us. Um, <laughs> and how now the power of technology is raising even more issues about which you have expressed concern. You know, as we wrap up, uh, I want to thank you for uh, your questions and, and um, a massive round of applause for Faye. Thank you. In leading up to this conversation, one of the things that, uh, that Faye and I talked about and in response to some of your questions uh, is we talked about this notion of having had uh, or touched multiple careers in our careers, and mine shorter than her illustrious career. I think one thing I would just say to you in the room, particularly the students in the room, uh, I look at myself now, I'm on my third career. I'm in the nonprofit world, but I spent a decade on Wall Street, a decade in media, and now running a philanthropy. You learn things by putting yourself in other environments. And, it, and what's critically important is, is to put yourself in other environments, to listen, to learn. You know, when Faye talked about being in a constant state of learning, Dr. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General, who I would argue is one of the most illustrious leaders uh, in our lifetime. Uh, he said to me when I met him six, seven years ago, he said, Alexis, we're in a constant state of learning. Well, he's in his late 80s now. <laughs> and the notion that we can listen to one another, learn from one another, and your question about mentors is such a beautiful and important question. Because your mentors should be the women in this room, the women who come from backgrounds that you don't know. But just as she talked about, your mentors should be men. And you need to understand their point of view just as much as you understand your point of view. So I would encourage you to look at your career and your projection and say, let me go do three different things because I'm a woman and I can do it. And oh, by the way, in the process, open myself up to learning and listening to people who come from other backgrounds. To me, learning about Faye's story, I've known Faye's story, who hasn't known Faye's story? But in reading about her story, I learned so much more about her, and in listening to her, you learn things that you will always remember when you walk out of this room today. So Faye, I'm gonna give you the closing word because you are the one who has taught us so much about perseverance. It's why I asked her how alone she felt at that moment in time running Planned Parenthood. As we walk out here today, your call to action for us is what? Well, let, let us not let this moment pass. Let us not go through this, this eruption again. Let us take from this time in the recognition that we are a part of history, 
We enjoy the right to vote as, uh, as an almost the, the, the example of, of, a ba of battles that took place a century ago. We enjoy many of the privileges of, of our own personal agency because of the sacrifices that have been made, that were made by women, by men. We enjoy the privilege of sitting in this room because of so much that has been accomplished for women in this country. We can't allow it to go back. You have, we have an obligation because of the privilege of our presence here to make sure that we go forth from this room, from this time, from this conference, organize, conduct yourself to an entity that can amplify your efforts, your resources. It is not an excuse that I'm too busy, I'm too, I, I, I have a, a um, I'm, I'm in, call, in, in the university, I'll do it later. Later is not a good, a, a good answer. We, we have an obligation because we're here to pay that debt to continue the progression for which we now have the benefit and the, the enjoyment of having a better life and a better future because someone made a sacrifice for us. No one sitting in this room is not the beneficiary of someone's sacrifice. And so we have an obligation to take that on and do it in your individual way and finding your own way, but just do it and recognize that the journey is a very long one. It's not ever going to be in our lifetime neatly tied up and accomplished and stayed put, but how we leave it will define our worthiness for the privilege that we've been given. Thank you for being here. Bravo! Woo! You have a fantastic oh, you did. You did. What an honor. An honor. Say Waddleton. Thank you. We have a short break now, and then your breakout sessions start at 11.15. Uh, so you, as you, we need to exit out this room to your breakout session. So you have a short break, and then uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.